Sometimes we have people that are that are that are in position but not in power. And what and what do you mean there? I'm glad that you asked me because we can hold position, but unless the Holy Spirit give you power, you will never be able to operate under the unction of the Holy Ghost. These these Pharisees. They always tried to trip Jesus up with some legalistic questions about custom and tradition. And, and, and they, were, they were the ones that were always tied around self-righteousness. And self-righteousness was, if I believe that I can keep the law, I'm righteous. But though what Jesus is trying to expose unto us is not about what you can keep. Can I get a witness here? But it's all about what you believe in your heart. For the Bible does not tell us the way to salvation is through the Torah. The Bible does not tell us the way to salvation is through the Pentateuch. The Bible does not tell us the way to salvation is to under, to obey what Adam said. The Bible does not tell us the way to salvation is to fall under the Mosaic law. But the Bible tells us the way to salvation is to believe that Jesus is the Son of God and that he died. I'm going to preach it here today. But not only in Luke in Matthew chapter 19 does he deal with the Pharisees and their legalistic um, mindset and their self-righteous position, but he also deals with a young rich man which represented self-serving. Amen. It is easy for religious people to feel that discipleship is practiced by rigid adherence to do's and to don'ts. I got a witness in here. Or by enthusiastic commitment to doing good. And let me go back and tell you that, that, that God really doesn't, he, he does hold us accountable for our do's and our don'ts, but though he never presents us with a list of what we can do and what we should not do when we come into his house for worship. Now he does give us the do's and the don'ts to Christian behavior, but he never gives us the do's to don'ts to Christian worship. Y'all miss me in here. Come on in here, help me somebody. And, and for that person that always is stuck to doing good, let me tell you, doing good will not will not get you into heaven. Because there's a whole lot of people that's doing good, but they're on their way to a Christless grave. Do I have a witness in here? But then, but then Matthew moves to chapter 20, where Jesus tells a parable of, of three. And he starts out with a vineyard that teaches that every relationship with God rests, rests on his grace and his generosity. We wrongly assume that the harder we work, the greater our reward. It is not self-effort. Somebody didn't hear me in here. It is not self-effort, but it's the responsiveness to Christ's word that counts the most. Can I get a witness in here? I don't want, I don't want to get ahead of myself, but it's starting to feel good to me, D. But not only are we to understand that, but also in Matthew chapter 20 is where we find that Jesus again predicts his death. Uh, but the disciples are too focused on visions of power when Christ would become king to hear what he had to say. And sometimes we get too busy on trying to hear what authority we do have in our position. <laughs> oh, y'all not feeling me this morning. Sometimes we get too eager to listen to the authority that we have in our position rather than listen to the responsibility that falls on our shoulder as a leader. It, it, it goes to show that, 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 that most people go diametrically in the opposite direction when it comes to the essentials of leadership designed by Jesus. Because see, the essentials of leadership designed by Jesus shows the leader in the mix of the ministry. Oh, y'all didn't catch me there. I, I, I said, I said the, the frame, the fabric in the framework that's been designed by Jesus to show us the true pattern of leadership is a leader that's in the mix of ministry. What am, what am, I, what am I saying? Is that in every leader should have a service heart. 
That's, that's the gospel right there. Every leader should have a service heart. It's not about power. It's not about prestige. It's not about title without task. But it's all about you have to, if God has called you to lead his people, he's first called you to serve his people. Because we understand that he is the leader and all we're doing is just following behind him. And when we follow behind him, then everything lines up in its proper place. Oh, I feel it in here. That's why Deacon Jackson, I can say that when I come to church, I don't come to satisfy people. But the reality to it is, Sister Harris said, when I'm satisfying God, I'm automatically satisfying his people. Did y'all catch that? Did you get that? When, I, when I'm doing what God wants me to do, I don't have to worry about if you don't like it or not because the same minds of Christ think along the same lines. So now, so now Jesus moves. Do you see him moving? It's in Matthew chapter 20 that he's moving. And as he's moving to Jerusalem, he has a crowd with him. He has a multitude with him. He has some Galilean pilgrims with him. And the destination is Jerusalem. They're coming from Bethany going to Jerusalem. Now, they could have cut through Samaria. But they didn't cut through Samaria to get to Jerusalem. Because anybody that understands that if you really wanted to get to Jerusalem, the fastest route was to go through Samaria. But he, he negates that route this time, and I understand why. Because from going from Bethany to Jerusalem, he takes what we call the Jericho Road. And in taking the Jericho Road is where we run into two blind men sitting on the road. And on the roadside sits these two blind men that begs the attention in the audience of Jesus, not that he can give them money, not that they, not that he can give them silver or gold, but he wanted to receive his sight. Do I have a witness in here? And after Jesus restores the blind man's sight, the Bible tells us that he gets up and he follows Jesus in the way. Now, now he must not have known the time of the year or, or where Jesus was going because at this time of the year, it was the time for the feast of the Passover. And what my Lord, my God, and my Savior, what is our, what is our lamb doing walking to his own sacrifice? Because old tradition was that the priest went out and he selected the lamb that was to be sacrificed. But in this case, Jesus is the sacrifice and he is leading not the sheep to the slaughter, but he's leading the sheep to paradise. Oh, y'all to help me preach here this morning. So in this text here today, we see in Matthew chapter 21. Do you see it here with me? We see it here in Matthew chapter 21. We see Jesus now making what we consider his triumphant entry. Well, that's strange to me. It should be strange to you too because, see, triumph comes after the victory. Triumph comes after the battle. And, and, and see, in, 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 in Jewish custom, the tradition or the, or, the, or the standard was whenever a king was a conquering king, he would come in riding on a war horse. But not my Lord and my Savior Jesus Christ. He came riding in on a donkey. What, is that, what does that mean to me? That, that means that he picked out God's humblest small animal. Oh, y'all not hearing me here. He picked out God's humblest animal and decided to ride in on something that was humble instead of something that was fierce. Y'all miss me here. What does that mean? That, 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 that we, the children of God, we should never look to seize the spotlight, but we should always look to see how humble we can be in the service because the reality to it is God don't need none of us, and the reality to it is I'm just glad that he let me be a part of the service. But not only that, but not only that, why did he come right?